Welcome to another moment in the Word. Do you believe in providence? And I mean God's providence. I mean how God foresees and God provides. And what happens if you do believe in God's providence? How, what, how, what changes in your life? And how does it affect the future? Well, interestingly, we find that in the, the last paragraph of the eighth chapter of the book of Acts. We're looking at this Ethiopian eunuch who is reading, and it's not by coincidence, not by accident, he's reading Isaiah 53. And he's reading a particular passage within Isaiah 53. And God has called Philip to go and to minister, but he doesn't know where he's going or what he's going to do when he gets there. But the Holy Spirit then directs him to a particular chariot and then to speak to this man. And he asks the man, the Ethiopian eunuch, do you understand what you're reading? And the man says, how can I know? except someone instruct me. And so consequently, he then begs that Philip join him in the chariot, sit next to him. And now there's a Bible lesson. Well, we now see how the Ethiopian eunuch responds when Philip tells him that this passage is talking about Jesus. We're now in verse 35 in chapter 8 in the book of Acts. And Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached on him Jesus. And they went on in their way and came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, then you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they both went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip, he found at Azores the, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Well, as we're seeing here, this is an incredible passage. He was going to Isaiah 53. It's Isaiah 53, and the particular passage is actually verses 7 and 8. And it says that he was, excuse me, 8 and 9, it says he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? That word for taken in the Hebrew means to be snatched away, to be taken hurriedly. And who shall declare his generation? That word means to consider, to meditate on. It's so important who really of his generation, of the time in which Jesus was alive here on earth, incarnated, when was there anyone that really got it? Well, that is how this passage begins. It begins by saying, who hath believed a report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Notice that the order there is believing is followed by hearing the report that it's been revealed. God must reveal the report by the Spirit of God in order for you to believe. But who did? Who meditated? Well, there were many that came to know Jesus as Savior and Lord. And that was a result of the working of the Holy Spirit. And we see that in the apostles. We see that in the 120. We see that in the 3,000 that were saved on the day of Pentecost. We see that in the 5,000 that were subsequently uh, believing on Christ, baptized, and joining with the body of Christ. We see that then growing to the point that it's probably 25, 30,000 by the time that Philip now is on the scene and that God has appointed him. But in the knowing of who Jesus is, it has to be the Spirit of God revealing 
this Ethiopian eunuch is in Jerusalem and he's there as a part of a pilgrimage and probably for a whole high holy day and as having come, he could have had opportunity to speak to a scribe or to a Pharisee, but if he did, and they hadn't meditated, they hadn't spent time in the Word, they hadn't sought the Holy Spirit's direction, they would not have realized that that passage is talking about the humility and humiliation of the Lord Jesus himself. It is now Philip that brings that awareness. And that is why he preached, he evangelized Jesus. It's important that the body of Christ evangelize, that share the gospel of Jesus. There is no other solution to the world's problems apart from Jesus. There is no other solution in your life or in mine other than Jesus, because Jesus is God. He is the only Savior. He is, therefore, the rightful Lord. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. We understand that there was wadis in this area. A wadi is a dry valley that fills up with water during the early and latter rain, which gives us some indication that more than likely this eunuch was there for Passover. And now, again in the providence of God, that this eunuch, is reading Isaiah 53 and this passage that this eunuch happens to meet with Philip, who's called now 80 miles away to come and to meet with him, that the Holy Spirit tells him which chariot, all of this is in the providence of God. There is no luck. There is no happenstance. It is all ordained and orchestrated by God. And now there is water. And the eunuch says, see, Look, behold, there's water. And now he asks, what hinders me? What stops me? What prevents me from being baptized? Well, where did he learn about baptism? Well, baptism was part of the early church's response to a person receiving Christ. You see, Jesus had said in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, all authority is given unto me. Go you therefore. Actually, in the Greek, it is a participle. While you're going. It doesn't matter where you're going. It is while you're going. You make disciples. That's the verb. And how do you make disciples? There's two more participles. Baptizing and teaching. The call then is not just to evangelize, but to disciple. That's what Philip is doing. Philip has first evangelized, told him about Jesus, but we don't stop there. And in your ministry, don't stop there. And if you're with your children, grandchildren, or you a pastor or evangelist or teacher, don't just stop in telling people about Jesus disciple them so they become disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus, that they become imitators of God as dear children of the Lord Jesus. And so consequently, there's water. What does the water symbolize? In Romans chapter 6, it symbolizes the death death unto sin, burial, that it is in the past, it is now buried and then risen the resurrection of Jesus. It is an identification with him. It is the initiation of the believer into discipleship. Then we continue to teach. You don't stop teaching. The whole purpose of us continually going through the word of God is that we might learn and be transformed in our minds that we would present our bodies living, wholly acceptable unto God. And so, as a result of Philip, he says, this said to him, if you believe in your heart, then you may be baptized. The formula that is mentioned here is the same one that we find Paul mentioning in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. That if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes to righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. This man makes a confession. Then what happens? Well, then we find that he, that is referring back to the eunuch, 
he commands the chariot to stop. And not only does it stop, but the two of them go down into the water. Obviously, this isn't just a sprinkling or a pouring. They're going into the water. Why? Well, if they wanted the sprinkling, they have plenty of canteens. They could have just simply sprinkled. But the fact that there was a large body of water, large enough for them to go into, fulfills the picture of what we see back in Romans chapter 6, that we are dead unto sin, buried into Christ, and resurrected to a new life. That's the picture. And I encourage you to recognize that baptism is very important in the process of discipling someone. And then, after they were baptized, verse 39, they come up out of the water, and the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. Oh, this is the same Holy Spirit that had directed Philip to run, catch the chariot, then to adhere to this man and to teach him. And the same Holy Spirit that's directing you now catches him away. What's that word? Harpazo is the Greek word, and it means to pillage, to plunder, to take, to seize, to catch away. It's the same word that is used many times in the New Testament. It's used in, for instance, the Second Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, where Paul says, I knew a man that was caught away, caught away into the third heaven. We see it also in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where he talks about the dead in Christ shall be raised first, then we who are alive and remaining shall be caught up. That word, harpazo, caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. It has to do with what we call the rapture. And why do we call it the rapture? Because the Latin word for harpazo is rapio, and that word is the word that we get our English word rapture from. It's the same idea and the same heap Greek word that is used back in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 23, where it talks about Elisha, and he is now performing various works, and there are some young men that are making fun of him and mocking him, and they're saying right after Elijah had been taken up in a fiery chariot, he says to them, they, the, the uh, students say to Elisha, go up, thou bald head, go up. It is actually a mockery of the rapture. This man, it seems strange to you perhaps, but that's what providence is. Providence is clearly an act of God that is not just the sequence of events in a point of time. It is also what can only be explained in God terms, that God is working and in such a miraculous way that he takes then Philip away from the eunuch. Why is that so important? And why would the eunuch be so interested in that? Because the very first word that we looked at before in verse 8 of chapter 53 in Isaiah, he was taken, taken away. The same Greek word that would have been translated in the Septuagint, rapizo, that he was taken away, harpazo. And now we find then what happens? Well, we have then the eunuch. He's rejoicing. He's rejoicing. He's rejoicing in the Lord. And he continues to go back then to Ethiopia. Ethiopia is the second country to have actually named Christianity as the national religion of the country. That's in 325 AD. That is amazing. And it's probably because of what God was doing with this Ethiopian eunuch. And even to this day, in Ethiopia, there's a very strong contingency, community of believers among the Coptic Christians. And then we find what happens to Philip. Well, Philip was found in what's today called Ashdod, and he's passing through. And what is he doing? Well, he's not resting on his laurels by any means. This man is still preaching, and the word is evangelizing. 
He's continuing to tell others about Jesus all the way from Ashdod to Caesarea. And that is 58 miles all on the seacoast of the Mediterranean, every village, every city. While you're going, are you making disciples? And if so, are you experiencing the providence of God that while you're going, you're seeing events fold into place. You're seeing e ways, people, things that are all seemingly working together and you didn't orchestrate it. You know that God's hand is all over your life. And if so, you like the eunuch and like Philip are rejoicing and continuing the work of evangelism. Father, thank you so much for this account and for how you worked in Philip's life and what an evangelist he is, what a model he is for all of us, and what an encouragement. We pray, Father, that each of us are faithful to the Great Commission, that we, while we're going, are making disciples. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray.